I work as a researcher on inequality at Oxfam. And Oxfam's been established for 75 years now. This is a picture of the original Oxfam shop in Broad Street in Oxford, which was 75 years old last year. We do work on humanitarian relief, long-term development and campaigning, all in the fight against poverty and injustice. Now, <clears throat> in 2014, we launched a global campaign against extreme and rising inequality. Now, this was because it was clear that in so many contexts in which we were looking at poverty and injustice, that the, the challenge to address the challenges, it wasn't important just to look at the bottom of the dis distribution, at those that were living in poverty, excluded and marginalised, but we also had to look very clearly at the top of the distribution, those with wealth, with power, with privilege. And as a result, we've launched this campaign on extreme and rising inequality. It's necessary to look at the whole of the economic distribution and understand relative access, relative experience and opportunities, and indeed mobility across the economic distribution, if we're to live in a world free of poverty. So today I've broken the presentation down into two different aspects in which we're looking at data and inequality. The first one is around measuring inequality, and that's very much the first area which Mark described that the Turing Institute's been looking at it from this seminar series. So this is really about using data to understand the economic distribution. The second is about measuring policies. So that's what Oxfam's been doing to try and gather data to help us understand what in particular governments can and should and have been doing to introduce policies that can actually reduce inequality within their countries. So first of all, measuring inequality. Now, the last few years have seen a bit of an explosion of research um, looking into the economic distribution. Um, in the top left here, we've got research that's been conducted by the World Bank. And this comes from their flagship report, which draws on the data which measures poverty and, um, and, social and inclusion. Here we've got the data which shows that on the light, green, on the light blue bars, inequality between countries has actually been reducing over time. So that's as poorer countries have been growing faster than richer countries. Whilst at the same time, the dark blue bars show that inequality within countries has actually been on the rise. In the bottom left-hand corner here, this data comes from work which was, has been developed by Thomas Piketty and others, which has looked very much at the very top of the income distribution. Here we've got data on the share of income of the richest 10%. And over time, you can see that the richest 10% have get, been gaining an increasing share of total income. And here this work was really developed due to a recognition that household data, which tries to capture the whole of the economic distribution, really underestimates income at the very top. So the richest people generally don't answer household surveys, and when they do, they underestimate the total income they have. So this data is drawing on tax records, which is a far better approximation of the incomes at the very top. Over here, we've got work which builds on um, Branko Milanovic's work, which has drawn together all the data on the income distribution around the world and has mapped the increase in income of different parts of the global income distribution. So here what we find is that over time, between 1980 and 2016, we can see globalization's winners and losers. The winners, the ones that have seen the, the greatest increase in their income, have been the richest in the world, the richest 1% in the world, peop rich people in rich countries. The other winners have also been people living in emerging markets. These have been people in China, for example, that have seen a rapid increase in their incomes and a rapid decline in extreme poverty in those contexts too. The losers have been lower income people in richer countries in the US and in the EU, and also those who remain trapped in extreme poverty. Over here, we've got research by Brookings, and they also build on the recognition that household income data underestimates incomes at the very top, and therefore all our estimates for income inequality are conservative. So what they do is they compare household survey data and the total amount of income estimated by that with the total amount of income estimated by national accounts data. 
The difference between the two, the fact that national accounts data is actually higher than the total amount of income in household survey data, is accounted for by the, the missing data on the richest people. So when you add back in this amount of the difference between the two methods of calculating income and estimate that it's all at the top of the distribution, you end up with Gini coefficients, which is a measure for the total income distribution, that are much higher than as would be estimated just with the household income data. So there's been a wealth of data and research that's expanded our knowledge and understanding of the income distribution and helped to adjust for those bits of the distribution that have not been well understood in the past. However, most of the data, particularly household survey data in developing countries, is based on consumption. And we know that when you're measuring inequality of consumption, you're underestimating inequality of income. Because particularly at the top, not all of your income is consumed. So you save some of that income. So the differences between people's incomes is much greater than the differences between people's consumption. But we also know that wealth inequality is far greater than income inequality. And wealth, in and of itself, is a really important piece of the economic puzzle to understand. Wealth, we know, provides people with security, with property, with land, with assets that they can then build a future income from. It provides resources to invest in education or to start a business, and to be able to re respond to shocks like a medical bill or a poor harvest. So our research in the last few years, when looking at the data, has really actually focused on wealth inequality and looking at the wealth distribution, as this has also been much less, um, much less thoroughly researched by other researchers around the world. So we start by taking the best available data source we have, which maps out the global wealth distribution. And this comes from Credit Suisse and their global wealth data book. And Credit Suisse... Sorry, I just wanted to quickly ask, what do you mean by wealth? Wealth, financial and non-financial assets minus debt. Um, so we're talking about personal wealth, household wealth. We're not talking about um, government wealth, and we're not talking about natural resources. Um, so what they're doing, they're mapping household wealth distribution around the world. And this builds on about a decade of research by Anthony Shorrox and his colleagues. And here they gather together data from national accounts on financial and non-financial assets, and again, household survey data, which maps the wealth distribution between households. And so here you can see the global wealth distribution from the poorest 10% of people in the world, as measured by wealth, to the richest 10% of people in the world. Here, these poorest 10% of people, all of them are in net debt, so they have negative wealth. Most of these people live in Africa, Asia Pacific, and India, but there's also a chunk of people from the richer world. These are people living in debt in places like the US and Europe. These include student debts, credit card debts, and so on. At the top end of the distribution, you've got mostly people living in North America, Europe, and countries in Asia Pacific like Japan and Singapore and Korea. This gives us an amazing resource to delve into. The Credit Suisse data set tells us about the wealth distribution within countries and between them and as the globe and, and as the world as a whole. So here we've got data which tells us the share of wealth of each decile in every country, but also in the world. And in the 2017 data set, they found that the richest 1% of people in the world had 50.13% of total wealth. So what that means is the richest 1% of people in the world had more wealth than the entire rest of the world put together. 1% had more than 99%. And they provide data over time as well. So we can see that particularly over the last decade, the share of wealth of the richest 1% has been increasing over time, such that it's just pipped over that 50% marker. So we wanted to think not just about the stocks of wealth and who has the stock of wealth within countries and between countries, but also about how that's been changing over time. Now, we know that wealth has been growing. Global wealth has been growing year on year on year. 
but also because the share of wealth of the richest 1% has been growing, we wanted to understand what that would look like in numbers. So we calculated what, in real terms, the total increase in wealth had been just in the last 12 months of data. So in the last 12 months of data, in real terms, global wealth had increased by just over 9 trillion US dollars. When we looked at the increase in total wealth of the richest 1%, they'd increased their wealth by $7.6 trillion. $7.6 trillion is 82% of $9.2 trillion. So what that's telling us is that of the increase in wealth over the last 12 months, four out of every five dollars has gone straight into the hands of the richest 1%, those people that already have wealth stocks of over 770,000 US dollars. Now this statistic got us a lot of attention. We used it as the headline finding on a report that we published in January this year, which we took to Davos. And we did that very deliberately because the people meeting at Davos are commonly rich and powerful individuals, people in the richest 1% that have seen their wealth accumulate over the last 12 months. And what we wanted to do is remind them that their experience of the economy has been very different to that of everybody else. So we wanted to put front and center the difference between the experiences of the wealthy and the experiences of everyone else at the forum where they're discussing the health and the future of our economy. Another data source we have used to understand extreme wealth has been data provide, provided by Forbes. So Forbes use journalistic methods to examine the assets of the very wealthy. So they look at their stock holdings, they look at their property, they look at how many yachts they have. And they provide this great publicly available source every year which provides your names, your net worth, where they're from and how they've made their money. This data has been collected and published since 2000. So we can also see how this data has changed over time. And in terms of the number of billionaires, the number of individuals that have assets over a billion dollars and their cumulative wealth, we can see a clear increase over the last um, 17 years in the data. Here, of course, you can see what happened as a result of the global financial crisis, particularly when stock prices has plummeted, but we've seen more than an adequate recovery of those individuals since then. What we wanted to do to put the wealth of these rich individuals at the very top of the distribution into perspective is to compare that with the data that we got from Credit Suisse, which looks at the whole of the rest of the distribution. So what we did was add up the wealth of everyone in the bottom half of the global distribution. So that's global deciles, one, two, three, four, and five. The richest 10% of people in the world, people that are in net debt, so the, the negative sign here, the second decile, third, fourth, and fifth. If you add up the share of wealth of all these five deciles, so we're talking about more than three and a half billion people in the world, together they share half of 1% of total wealth. In dollar terms, that's about 1.5 trillion. In 2017, if you added up the wealth of the billionaires, you only need to count down to 42 billionaires before you got that same value there of 1.486 trillion. So the other way that we wanted to put this wealth data in perspective is by making that strong point that it really doesn't take much, many billionaires to accumulate the same amount of wealth as the bottom half of the planet. So with all this wealth data, we think it's given us some great insights in the way that the economic distribution looks like and looks like over time. But we recognize that there are enormous caveats and limitations with working with this global wealth data. Wealth is incredibly difficult to measure. So it's a great question in terms of how we measure the wealth, even at the individual level. I mean, particularly at the top of the distribution, wealth is very volatile. And of those billionaires that you see on the Forbes listing, their net wealth changes day to day by up to some, in some cases, plus or minus five or 10 billion a day, purely due to their stock holdings and the fluctuations on the stock market. But we also know that there's um, great use of tax havens. Many of, much of this assets 
can't be traced and can't be found. Um, and that some of the individuals, be they royalty, aren't included on the Forbes list at all. And their, their assets and their wealth is intertwined with the, the wealth and the assets of the state. Meanwhile, at the bottom of the distribution, the quality of data is extremely poor. Where people's assets, people's wealth, is really about how much livestock they have or land which is very difficult to value and, and property rights are very unclear. The data, particularly in Credit Suisse, is openly described as of poor quality for many countries in the developing world. Of course, debt, we, we take into account debt in all our calculations and that comes up as a negative um, in, in our wealth calculations. But debt isn't always negative. So taking out debt, having debt, doesn't necessarily mean that you're poor and doesn't necessarily mean that you're vulnerable. Particularly, for example, the, um, the criticism we always get when we talk about wealth statistics is the, the Harvard graduate, the graduate that has several hundred thousand dollars, perhaps, worth of student debt, but is also on a very high salary and will recoup that debt very quickly. And finally, there's a, a non-linear, or at least a, a murky relationship between income and wealth. So again, just because somebody doesn't have much wealth doesn't mean they're poor. And similarly, someone who might be recorded as having quite a lot of wealth, so we're talking about, for example, um, a retiree that lives in a, in a house in Camden that they've owned their whole life, and their house is now worth over a million pounds, would appear at the top of the economic distribution. They'd be in the richest 1%. But that isn't necessarily because they've got sufficient income to sustain them. So there's a lot of caveats and a lot we can discuss in terms of the limitations um, with working with this wealth data. The second part of this presentation is the work that we've done in measuring policies. So with the one hand, we want to understand the economic distribution. And we've been do doing that by looking at other research on the income and the wealth distribution. But the purpose of Oxfam working on inequality is that we want to do something about it. And we want to incentivize change as well. So what we're looking at here is all the policy tools that governments have at their disposal to have an effect on the economic distribution. So we know that they have a range of policy tools at their disposal. Governments can do a lot to augment the economic distribution. For example, spending. We know that spending on social protection directly puts money in the hands of the poorest people, and that spending on health and education um, puts money in kind in the hands disproportionately of those at the bottom of the distribution. We know that tax can, if managed progressively, can be used to take money from the richest people in society and close the gap between the rich and the poor. And of course, within the labour market, rules and regulations can determine how market income is distributed in the first place. Now, these are kind of standard or general policy tools that a government will have at its disposal. There's many things that a government can do, particularly around the specific inequalities in the society, around gender, ethnicity, spatial differences. But what we wanted to do is come up with some general rules of thumb that we could compare between countries and use as an incentive to get governments to look at their policy mix and what they're doing to reduce inequality in comparison with their nearest neighbours and their peers. So using those three general areas, spending, tax, and labour markets, we've produced an index which includes indicators that are looking at all of these three policy areas. So I'm just going to take you in turn through each of these three policy areas and how we're measuring whether governments are doing enough to reduce the gap between the rich and the poor. We're measuring a bunch of different stuff here. All these different indicators are on completely different scales. So to produce an index, we had to standardize the data so that we can pull it all together into an index. And we just used the most straightforward approach. So we used the min-max methodology to standardize all those indicators to a zero to one scale. And we did that using the highest score in the sample, getting a one. So a country that's actually achieved the best score possible will always get a one. And the country that scores the lowest gets a zero. So we're using real or actual minimum and maximum values to rescale that data. 
We also had support from the um, Joint Research Council at the European Commission, who gave us an audit on our approach to this. And we adjusted some of our indicators accordingly and threw out a couple that didn't fit the model that we were looking at. So this slide, this, um, this diagram, actually comes from Neuralistic's work at the Centre for Equity Project. So there's a, a, a whole research, um, which I'll actually get to in another slide later, which is looking specifically at the incidence of different policies along this flowchart and how they can be effective at reducing the distribution, the, the inequality. <laughs> okay. Um, so on that first pillar, on spending, research finds that, in general, rule of thumb, the more you spend on public services, on health and education, the more you will reduce inequality. General rule of thumb, spending on health and education is good to reduce the gap between the rich and the poor. Also, kind of obviously, spending on social protection can directly reduce the gap between the rich and the poor. So the first indicator we look at is purely the volume of spending as a share of total spending that goes to health, education and social protection. Our partners on this project is Development Finance International. So they spent many years going country to country looking at budget data. So they've gathered all the data available on spending on different sectors within their economy both in terms of what they budget and what they actually spend. So what we've done is work with them to use the actual spending on these different sectors around the world. Yeah. I find that the chart that in 2015, they spent nothing on defence. So the, they've declared, this is what they've declared. <laughs> this is what they've produced in their actual accounts. If there's no data there, it's because of no data, not zero spending. But we're, we're taking from this, we're only pulling the social protection, the education and the health data out of that. So more spending is good, but we also know that spending on these different sectors will have a different impact on the actual economic distribution. Some spending is more effective than others at reducing the Gini coefficient. Now, I mentioned the Commitment to Equity project before, the ones that were behind that flowchart, and they've looked country to country in 28 countries around the world, specifically at how spending on education, social protection and health actually reduces the Gini coefficient. So they've calculated a value, an actual reduction in the Gini coefficient from the spending. And this is related to the kind of spending. So on education, for example, if you put all your money into tertiary education, particularly in developing countries, that tends to disproportionately benefit richer kids. Primary education, however, disproportionately benefits poorer kids. So if you direct your education budget much more into primary education, you'll have a much bigger impact on your Gini coefficient overall. So we have data for 28 countries from the Commitment to Equity project on exactly how much this spending reduces the Gini coefficient. For several countries from the OECD, um, we've got the same sort of data, but for social protection. So we can measure how much spending on social protection actually reduces the Gini coefficient. For the other countries, we don't have that data. What we do have is a global study that's calculated coefficients generally on spending on education, on health and social protection. And so what we've done is we've calculated an estimate for how much they would reduce the Gini coefficient as a result of their spending, as a result of their spending measured as a portion of their GDP. So you have their spending as a proportion of GDP on education multiplied by the coefficient on education to estimate how much that education spending would reduce the Gini coefficient. And so our first pillar on spending looks like this. We've got all the data on education, on health and social protection. This is just the volume stuff averaged out. And then we've got the estimate for how much we would actually be able to reduce the Gini coefficient as a result of this spending. And then we average between the two. Very straightforward. The implicit weights are, that's worth the same amount as that, one, as that indicator. 
The second pillar is on tax. A uh, general rule of thumb here that we've used is that VAT is a regressive form of tax. So those at the bottom of the distribution disproportionately pay a larger share of their income on VAT when it's a flat rate across the whole of the, um, the, whole of the consumption bundle. However, we also know that when a government introduces exemptions, particularly on basic foodstuffs, actually VAT can be progressive. So the general rule of thumb here is that VAT rates, which are quite easily accessible from several tax guides that you can find on the internet, the higher your VAT rate, the more regressive your um, tax structure, unless you have certain exemptions in place. Personal income tax is slightly harder to come up with this general rule of thumb of what is progressive and what is regressive. What we've done here is look at how the uh, personal income tax rates change as your income changes. So that's what this term here is capturing. So if you see your tax rate change at a faster rate as your income changes than other countries, then you'll seem to be um, introducing a much more progressive personal income tax system. We then wanted to include um, the to top tax rate, so giving credit for countries that have a higher tax rate for top earners at the very top, but also wanted to consider the fact that we need a threshold that's high enough for those at the bottom of the distribution to avoid paying personal income tax. It took us a long time to come up with this formula. It is by no means perfect, and there's lots of interesting ways in which um, a country could, if you like, game this formula. Um, and this one in particular is something that we're really interested to hear from others in terms of how we can better measure the progressivity or regressivity of personal income tax um, structures that look so very different around the world. Not all countries have what we understand as different tax thresholds kicking in at different points in time. The second um, main set of indicators in the tax pillar is the same as what we were trying to do with the spending. So it's one thing to have your personal income tax, your VAT on paper. This is just what exists in the law, what you've written down the tax rates are. It's another to calculate how much is actually collected as a percentage of GDP and the extent to which that's actually going to reduce your Gini coefficient. So we use the same approach that we did with the spending data. For 28 countries, we've got actual data from the CEQ. And for the others, we use these generic global coefficients of the extent to which tax collected from these different sources can reduce the Gini coefficient. Now, of course, some taxes can actually increase the Gini coefficient. So some taxes are regressive. And that's why you see, as for example with VAT, that that coefficient is positive. So we know that the more you collect from certain kinds of taxes, the more you can actually increase your Gini coefficient. And then finally, for the tax pillar, we wanted to recognize that, again, it's one thing to have taxes on paper, but it's another to actually collect them. And that in many countries, tax evasion and avoidance is a real problem, particularly by people at the top of the distribution. So our third set of indicators on the tax pillar is a measure of how much we think governments should have collected as a total tax take compared with what they actually collected. So we've got two different methodologies for doing this, and we've then just averaged between the two. One is simply going tax by tax and estimating how much in total we think should be collected because of the size of the economy and the tax rate that's applied on those um, goods or services. And the second is a study that's been done by the IMF, which looks at all of the economic variables at the macro level and uses them, such as how much of the economy is based on agriculture, or corruption rates, and therefore uses that to estimate the total tax take that we would expect to see from a country. And then we just compare the actual tax take with these two different ways of calculating the expected tax take. As a result, our tax pillar looks like this. So we've got three main indicators. One which is all about the tax structure, so what's written down on paper, the tax rates. One which is about that incident stuff, so the extent to which the taxes actually reduce the Gini coefficient. And the third one about tax collection. So how good is the government at actually collecting the taxes that it has written down on paper? And finally, to the labour pillar. So here we've got 
the first indicator in the labour pillar, which is data which is taken directly from Penn State, which measures um, labour protections and union rights around the world. And here they have data in law and in practice. And this circle should be over that. <laughs> so we take the combined score of in law and in practice. So the extent to which labour rights are protected in law and the in practice stuff is measuring what the extent to which there are violations of people's labour rights as recorded um, in the media and in, um, in general in that country as experienced by workers. The second indicator is taken from the World Bank's Women, Business and the Law Guide and is looking at discrimination, gender pay discrimination and paternity rights in law in all the countries that we've got on our index. So it's 152 countries on our index. So these are legislations, this is what's in law to protect discrimination between men and women. The third indicator is minimum wages. And here we look at the level of the minimum wage as compared with the average level of income in the country. So countries where the minimum wage is a higher is higher compared to um, the average income in the country, get more credit for setting a minimum wage that helps to close the gap between the richest and the poorest. Now, we know with all those three indicators, so with the labour union rights, with women, women's rights in the workplace against discrimination and pay discrimination, and indeed with minimum wages, this, of course, only applies to people that are working in the formal sector. And particularly in developing countries, the informal sector is very large. And in, in many countries, the unemployment rate is very high. So all these great laws and legislations will actually not do very much to close the gap between the rich and the poor if not many people are covered by this legislation. As a result, we deflate these three indicators by, first of all, a measure for the informal sector and second of all, a measure for unemployment rates. So if you take a score, let's say a country scores a, a 0 0.7 on our rescaled um, index between 0 and 1, and half of the economy is working in the informal sector, then that 0 0.7 score translates immediately to a score of 0 0.35. So we're getting rid of all the people that this wouldn't apply to and only giving them credit for the proportion of the population where this legislation would actually um, protect workers. So as a result, this is what our third pillar looks like. So here we've got labour union rights, here we've got legal protection for women workers, and here we've got minimum wages and the extent to which they're considered fair. And all of this is averaged again, equal weighting, one, 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 to come up with the average for our labour pillar. At the end of the day, we end up with our commitment to reducing inequality index. So again, it's a straightforward average, so equal weighting for the three of the pillars on spending, on tax, and on labour markets. The winner, the top of our index, the country that's doing most to reduce inequality is Sweden, and the country that's doing least to reduce inequality is Nigeria. So in many ways, there's some kind of unsurprising best and worst performance. And it's, it's always quite annoying when a Nordic country or a Scandinavian country comes top of an index. We've seen it all before. Um, and particularly Nigeria at the bottom as well. Um, but actually, it also has, this index has turned up some quite surprising findings as well. So for example, education spending in Zimbabwe is actually the highest in the world. And it's recorded and studied by UNESCO to be having a major impact on inequality. So there's one policy area that actually Zimbabwe are doing particularly well on. And for Oxfam, that really helps our engagement with Zimbabwe. So rather than you know, criticise all the policy, the policy mix of the entire country, we can recognise that there's, there's a balance and some, some policies are working better than others. Tax policy in Sweden, on the other hand, the Swedish tax system is the 120th most progressive. So it's really right down there of 152 countries on the index. And that's due to large cuts in the personal income tax and the corporation tax. Um, and that really challenges Sweden's widespread image for being a very progressive economy. In particular, we found that in Namibia and South Africa, 
they do quite well on the index. And these are two of the most unequal countries in the world. And we looked into this in more detail, and, and there's a quite complex relationship between the level of inequality and the extent to which we're finding through this data that governments are implementing policies that are reducing inequality. And in Namibia and South Africa in particular, they've got such a high level of inequality at the moment, but an even higher level of market inequality. So actually, they're already doing quite a lot to redistribute between the rich and the poor, but they're just starting from such a high, um, high level of inequality in the first place due to their structural inequalities and a long legacy of inequality, which is not what we wanted to, if you like, punish the countries for. So what we're doing with this is taking into account the policy mix at a point in time with using the most recent data and not for what's the history of the country that's gone before that. Um, just in terms of like the, um, the separation between the informal economy and the formal economy, um, what are the proportions we're talking about there and does that vary from country to country as well? There may be some uh, opportunities in the informal sector that aren't being recognised in these, these figures. Yeah, so what we wanted to capture is the extent to which um, the government have put in place policies to protect people and to help um, you know, support the incomes of people at the bottom of the distribution and potentially keep a cap on the incomes at the top, but we don't actually have any data that addresses the top of the income distribution in terms of the labour market. Um, when it comes to the informal sector, this is something that's almost by definition outside of the government's control. So there's no formal policies that protect the rights of workers in that sector. The variation between countries is enormous. You've got some countries where 80% of the economy is estimated to be in the informal sector, and then countries like the UK where it's much, much less than that. Um, so the variation in the informal sector is enormous, and that's why we thought it was so important that we didn't give countries like um, Liberia, for example, had the highest minimum wage as a proportion of national income. But because of the size of its informal sector, which you know is in the is in the region of 80%, we recognise that that minimum wage really doesn't kick in for very many people at all. So we wanted to make sure that we were deflating for it appropriately. Sorry, just on South Africa, um, how recent is that um, change in policy um, to, to address high levels of inequality? So it's, I mean, the, the data that we use for this is generally speaking from somewhere between 2015 and 2017. So it's all quite recent data. This is the first time that we've done this report. And so we can't at the moment track changes over time and what the policy yeah, mix looked like. Because you said you'd looked into um, the kind of, the, you drilled a bit deeper into South Africa and I just wondered when that change had come about. Well, what, so what we found with South Africa and indeed Namibia is that it's the structural levels of inequality that are incredibly high and that despite what on paper looks like a progressive policy mix, it can only do so much because it, the, the structural level of inequality is so high. Even if you essentially get a really good score on this index, you're still not going to be able to bring down income inequality very far and certainly it will still be one of the, the most unequal countries in the world. So this is a pilot, and it's all very new, and it was put together in the last 18 months and published in July last year. And the feedback that we've had when we've shared this with people around the world, including you guys, and what I'm looking for some feedback on as well, is that it's valuable. It makes a valuable contribution at the global, regional, and national level. It provides comparative data with which we can start to understand what governments can do on some quite general rule of thumb policy areas. Um, there are some, some really kind of interesting and complex relationships between the data and some other variables like GDP per capita, like those structural factors, like in South Africa, for example, where you've got a legacy of inequality that's really embedded. Um, the relationship with inequality itself is not straightforward in the case of South Africa and Namibia. Um, and, of course, human development. So what we've been looking at is the kind of relationships between the commitment to reducing inequality index and some of these other areas. But the questions we've also been asked are, are we measuring the right things? So we haven't got anything at the moment in there on governance and the extent to which people have voice and influence over the policy mix. 
And that has been really integral to the way that Oxfam's been looking at inequality. Our very first report on inequality was looking at the concentration of wealth and power and how that influences policies at the highest level. So really, we should be thinking about what kind of indicators we can use to recognise the importance of governance being inclusive as well. We're really weak on the gender, race and ethnicity um, inequalities and what governments can do to address them, but recognising that many of these are very difficult to compare country to country because the, the different horizontal inequalities or characteristical inequalities vary so much country to country. And at the moment, I mean, it's especially um, irritating that I started this um, presentation with a discussion on the wealth distribution and how extreme inequality of wealth is around the world. But we don't currently have good enough data that we can compare between countries on wealth taxes. So that's something that we're really looking to develop because property taxes can be some of the most progressive taxes if administered well in the world. Thank you.